We don't really know what it's like thinking or planning on doing or how it works really well. And if we keep scaling it and it becomes smarter than us, we don't know how to control it. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to look at AI, both what's happening now and what's happening next. Our guest is an artificial intelligence expert who specializes in AI safety. This is Dr. Roman Yampolsky. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. For me, from an outsider's perspective, like I've followed AI, I don't really understand what it is, but it seems like in the last six months, everything has changed. Has there been some kind of development that has just catapulted it forward? Or what's kind of like, what's happening in AI right now? Kind of, yeah. The last six months, a new product was released, which is the biggest uh, model ever trained. And unlike the previous 50 years of AI, it actually works. So everything we did so far was kind of like, oh, in this special case, it can play tic-tac-toe. This thing can do pretty much everything in different domains. It can translate, it can write essays, it can program, it can throw things. So we're finally dealing with something like AI from science fiction, AI from movies. AI people thought we're going to have when we talked about creating AI. Is this a big development? Like in the grand scheme of things for AI, was this a hard thing to do? Or was this like, oh, this is pretty easy and the complicated stuff is next? It's not easy. It took a lot of compute. So we never had hardware this powerful. We needed special computers to be powerful enough and we needed enough data to train them. So before internet, before everyone started posting everything online, we just didn't have data sets big enough. And uh, same with compute. Uh, the idea of neural networks uh, dates back to 1940s, artificial neural networks. But back then, we just didn't have computers powerful enough to run those simulations. So now we really kind of just have the technology in place to put this technology in place. Yep. And we're referring to chat. Is chat GBT the name of a company? The name of the program? Like, I'm a little bit unclear on that. So the company is called OpenAI. They use uh, models of human brain, loosely based on human brain. Uh, which are large collections of artificial neural uh, networks or large neural network simulating neurons in a human brain. Uh, the specific architecture which really makes it work well is a transformer. And the latest model they released is GPT-4. So they had previous ones, they were not as powerful. This is the latest one. So chat GPT is kind of a public interface to get access to this model. I kind of understand what it's doing, right? Like I put in, I want you to write me this paper, it writes me this paper. But from kind of a computer scientist perspective, like what is it doing? You know how autocomplete on your phone tries to guess the next word you're going to write and just help you out by doing it? That, but like really, really good at it. Like it knows everything about you, everything you ever wrote, read. It's just amazing at predicting the next token. So good it had to create models for like how computers work, how chess works. So it can be really good at guessing what the next statement would be in a program or next move in a chess game. But it's really just very, very complex predictor of next word. Does it understand or is it just really good at predicting? It needs to understand to predict at this level. So people argue about this word, what does it mean to understand? In terms of functionality, it's good enough to do things which, if human did it, we would have no doubt the human understands. Is this a good thing? If you want capabilities, yes. What, where's, what's, the, what's kind of the bad part about it, about it, potentially? We don't really know what it's like thinking or planning on doing or how it works really well. And if we keep scaling it and it becomes smarter than us, we don't know how to control it. Obviously, you know, like my mind immediately goes to like movies, right? That's the first thing that my mind goes to. Are those realistic scenarios? Like if this goes bad, how do you think that it actually goes bad? So movies emphasize visual aspects of how bad it will get. You have a physical embodiment Terminator killing people. 
This is just like that, but no robot bodies, just the intelligence, just the power of words and internet to manipulate the world. Manipulate the world, get someone bribe, blackmail to do things, maybe using nanotech, maybe using computer viruses, maybe using real viruses to do whatever it wants to accomplish. Let's just say that right now, for right now, when we look at chat GBT, those kind of, kind of technology, what do you think the impact is of that a year from now, five years, 10 years from now? So if we freeze it in time, we're not going to release the next generation. Obviously, this is very impactful for economy. You can automate so many jobs. I mean, whole industries pretty much don't need to be there. We can just use chat GPT for this type of work. Uh, long term, we don't really know, again, because uh, there is not just kind of incremental improvements, but this exponential, hyper-exponential race to get those systems to be as powerful as possible. So in a week, we now see more progress than we've seen in a year before. Do you think that we're kind of ready for this as a society? No. That's, that's what I thought the answer was going to be. Do you... Following up on that, right, do you think that the people who are in charge, and I'm putting air quotes up there, right, the people who are making the decisions, so to speak, have we really thought out, like, the the consequences of this? What's ultimately going to happen? Or are we kind of just like, we made this new toy, let's use it? Well, first of all, no one's in charge, really. Politicians have no idea what's going on in the industry. Industry doesn't fully understand the social aspects. So it's all kind of separated interests and they all care about their subdomain uh people who are making those systems not not like explicitly designing them but making them they don't really fully understand how they work either uh they consider possibilities they think about things like super intelligence and uh, general intelligence but uh, usually they go uh, let, let's let get a little closer to it and then we'll figure out what to do. We still want to monetize this next level of improvement. So sadly, there is very little thinking being done about how it's going to impact everything. What part, like if we, you know, we talk about, okay, so if we're not ready for this as a society, where do you think that we're kind of not ready for it? We have no legal framework for dealing with something like that uh, in terms of copyright for creative outputs, art, songs, movies, text. We have no responsibility for crimes committed or for patents granted. We don't really have economic safety net. If this thing automates majority of jobs, it's not obvious how, uh, how we're going to pay for people who lost their jobs. So you can look at every single aspect of society today and basically see how it's not in any way prepared or preparing for this technology. Do you think, though, is that the kind of stuff that like, OK, well, we'll figure this out, right? Like we always seem as a society to have this attitude of like, we're going to figure it out. Whatever problem is coming, we're going to figure it out. Is this, though, something that could fall into that realm? Like, all right, there's challenges, but we'll we'll get it. Some of those definitely, I mean, if you want uh, financial security, you can tax robot labor, AI labor, redistribute those funds. That's something government is good at, redistributing money. Uh, the problem of control, controlling the system itself, is something we don't have any technical solutions for. We don't know how to control more intelligent agents. We don't, even, we don't fully know if it's possible or not. It seems like it may not be possible. So that's the one where I would say we're unlikely to easily solve it. I'm a big numbers person in the sense that if you look at the AI technology that we have right now, and let's say one is, this isn't a real threat. 10 is like, man, we better watch out. Where do you think that we are kind of on that scale? Right now or what's coming next? Let's, let's do both. Right now we're pretty safe. I mean, clearly we have those systems and we're all here and nobody died. So... It's not a big deal. It will change social and economic situation, but it's not going to kill everyone. The next generation, we don't really know. It could be a slight improvement. It could be smarter than all of us combined. If it is and we don't control it, then it's a 10, 11, 12. When we look at AI in the general sense, so we have the chat GBT right now, where, 
what's the kind of the next couple of things that you see coming down the pipe? Uh, they just scaled their systems. So they had more compute, they had more data, train it longer, and it gets more and more capability. So you never probably heard about GPT-2 because it wasn't that capable. GPT-3, people started writing about, you had Copilot for programming, assisting programmers. Now, GPT-4 is kind of very general. Lots of people found it useful for what they do. So it's if the same level of progress continues forward in two, three years, we can have human level or more capable systems. The thing that I kind of don't really understand, right, is like, okay, how do we get from the AI computer that's doing my homework, so to speak, to Skynet taking over the world, right? Like, how does that, how does that play out? Like, how does one become the other? So specifically with military, uh, military is very interested in having their work automated. They want systems for detecting attacks, for automated response. So they would place AI in charge of our, let's say, nuclear response. So all it has to do is decide that this is the right decision. We are under attack, or maybe we need to be first to attack to win the war. And you have nuclear war generated by AI decisions. But of course, this is just what we have today, the infrastructure today, plus the systems we have today. If you have a system which is actually smarter than us, a super intelligent system, I have no idea how it would go about killing everyone. I'm not that intelligent. That's the point. Do you feel like the powers that be are listening to people like yourself? Or are you kind of falling on deaf ears? So there is definitely more happening now. There are conferences, there are panels, they're trying to listen. I'm not sure they have background to fully understand. So some of our leaders are 80 years old plus. I don't know if they actually use computers for anything. So it may be more up to the advisors to them to decide what's happening. That's the kind of thing that worries me too, right? It's like by the time that everybody understands the problem, it's, is it too late to solve the problem? We see simpler problems like uh, cryptocurrency and governance of uh, Bitcoin and things of that nature. It's been a decade and they haven't really produced any useful legislation in that space. Is there any chance, though, with stuff like this, right? Because there always seems to be the thing in society that is going to be the next big thing, right? Y2K was going to wreck everything. Cryptocurrency was going to change the world. And then it kind of just seemed to fade away. Is there any chance that this is a flash in the pan? So AI has a history of kind of those boom and bust cycles. You have AI winters where everything dies out, no funding. It seems unlikely at this point just because the level we're already at, you can monetize so much of it for new companies, for automation of labor, and the progress is not slowing down. But it's always possible. If we stop right now and for the next 10 years we don't have any progress, it doesn't really change anything. We have the same problem just in 10 years. We still don't know how to control it. We still don't know how to deal with it. It buys us a little time, so that would be wonderful. A lot of the things that I wanted to kind of talk about are pretty much summed up for some with our listener submitted questions. So are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Always. What's the ultimate risk? Everyone dies. But what would it be that would cause that? Mistaken programming, bad decision, malevolent actors doing it on purpose. Uh, I have a paper with like taxonomy of different ways to get to dangerous AI. Could you just real quick, like, sum up some of those categories? So most people understand malevolent actors really well. So bad guys, terrorists, crazies, cults decide to destroy the world on purpose. They use this advanced intelligence to help them achieve their goals. What areas do you think in society are most susceptible to change from AI? Like, we have a lot of kind of boring bullshit jobs we can easily automate and nobody would complain. I think that, but we would have to have, the, I guess, you know, the, the difficulty that I kind of look at from that side of it is like, right, but people have to have jobs. So what happens if it replaces everybody's job, right? Like that's kind of, I think, the worry that a lot of people have. So that's the idea with unconditional basic income, where you tax this technology, tax those corporations uh, making mega profits, and then you provide some sort of basic income for everyone enough to just exist but maybe not making you rich. And then you can do extra work if you're interested in making more. What do you think will happen in the next five to 10 years? So I don't know specifically, it's very hard to predict with specific dates. It, it seems like we're gonna get to human level and quickly after to super intelligence, 
but how soon it could be as soon as five years, it could take 10, 20, we don't really know. Has, I mean, I mean, has this kind of always been moving forward in the background, though? It was, but much slower. I mean, it was kind of linear progress, not exponential or hyper-exponential. People used to say it would be 50 years, 100 years before we see something like that. Now, not crazy people are saying it could be a year or two. What was your reaction when you started using it? The chat GBT. I was very impressed, uh, especially it, it's amazing that uh, you can get basic model for free, which is like incredible cutting edge technology for everyone. And you can get like the very latest, the best with internet access, with plugins for 20 bucks a month. Did you, what immediately jumped out as you as kind of the red flags about this kind of technology? Well, it, it does make up stuff. Like when you ask questions, which you really know answers to, like, tell me about Dr. Yampolsky, and it just makes up complete nonsense. You notice that. Why would it, but why would it do that? Why would it just make something up? It doesn't really know the difference between what is true and what is false. It just goes, what is the most likely token to complete this sentence? So if it says, Dr. Yampolsky has won an award for, if the most common thing to win a award for is chemistry, then it will say chemistry. Have you seen any examples come out of it that would say like, oh, that was a dangerous example or like, this is a problem? You can think about uh, all sorts of situations. People asking for medical treatment, for example, what medication should I take for this or that? And it can definitely give you bad advice. They're trying to filter it out, things like that. But there are so many ways to ask the same question in a different way to get it to answer that it still happens. Do you think that this will be a thing that however it changes society, do you think it will change it uniformly or will be, there will be big winners and big losers? Well, there are people who use it, who rely on it, and people who never heard of it. So obviously it's not going to be uniform for everyone. There is an advantage to being early to anything. Will there be certain demographics or certain areas of the world that you think like, oh, they're going to really benefit from this and these, this area is going to get hit? Again, it depends on what level. If we're talking about uncontrolled superintelligence, we're all going to be killed uniformly. It's going to be very equal and diverse. Uh, if we're talking about just economic benefit from technology we have right now, obviously places with advanced computing infrastructure, advanced education will benefit more than I don't know, Amish community, for example. When you look at kind of the future of AI, what is a movie or TV show that you feel like, oh, that's probably what it would look like, and a movie or TV show that's like, that's not the way this would work at all? So for short term, Black Mirror does a really good job of capturing a lot of kind of side effects of technology. We're going to have virtual reality, mind reading, things of that nature. It's really quality. They have a lot of episodes and each one is as good as a standalone movie. So that's a good example. As far as uh, something not very realistic, I mean, there are aspects of all this, like Matrix talks about humans being used as batteries for energy. That's not the best way to get your energy. So how do we kind of keep the bad stuff from happening and embrace the good stuff? That's a wonderful question. I've been trying to solve it for decades. I don't know. I bring problems. You give me solutions. If you were to like hold, right? Like you're out with your buddies though, talking about like, well, this might work. Is there anything that you could say would that might work? So I always believe in self-interest of people. If people truly believed that this is going to kill them, they would not push the button. They would not release it. They would not develop it and just be very happy enjoying billions of dollars they made with GPT-4. The companies that kind of make this, are they going to end up controlling the world? I mean, until they create this product and the product is out of control, right? You don't control uncontrolled superintelligence. That's the important point. Initially, you think you're going to be the guy controlling the light cone of the universe for forever. you got light. But the reality is you're the first victim of this technology, the closest thing to it. Do we understand what we have done? No. What part of it do you think, like, oh, that's, that's the, the part that we're failing to grasp? The difference in capability between what we are and what those systems will be. We kind of, when we think about someone super smart, we think of like Einstein, who was, you know, half a standard deviation away from smart people. We're not thinking something a thousand standard deviations above us. 
it's a level of intelligence that we wouldn't even be able to comprehend. Right. It would look kind of random to us. We wouldn't understand what it's doing or why. Is there, but I mean, are there, when you look at like the current technology, are there fail safes built into the system now? No. Why would anybody design something and not build fail safes into it though? That seems like. A... They don't know how to do it. Like there are basic security things. They protect the files from hackers. They have passwords, but it's not. The model itself would be very dangerous. What they do, they put filters on top of it. Don't say this word. Don't ever talk about this group of people. It's uh, after the fact uh, kind of filtering. It's not really changing the model to be safer. But why? Okay, I'm, I'm trying to understand as much as I can, right? Like, but why would we not be able to build fail safes into the system that would protect us no matter how smart this thing is? Because you can't outsmart something smarter. You think, uh, like, think about having a child, right? You can definitely control a small child. You can lock them. You can do all sorts of things where they can't figure out how to unlock the door. But it's not the other way around. Dumber things cannot control much smarter things indefinitely. The one thing that I kind of feel like, like maybe this is more a societal thing, is there any concern in your mind that it will kind of take away our ability to think, our creativity, that we'll be... I imagine us in some ways becoming like Wally, the movie Wally, where there's just people sitting on a boat, you know? Like, do you, are there any concerns in your mind or kind of in the intelligentsia mind about that? And like, well, what is this going to do for us as a society, even if it works perfectly for everything else? Absolutely. It's a huge concern. We see it with attention spans getting shorter and shorter. We see it with inability to read a map or just kind of participate in something complex it's definitely happening um that's pretty much really all the questions i mean you're you are efficient you are an efficient man i will say excellent I will, we solved that problem. i will say that but is there anything else that like you think that we should be talking about in regards to this so uh, your audience is very general i understand those are not experts with experts you can go deeper on certain aspects of it for a general audience i just uh, i want everyone to understand what is happening and that so-called experts have no idea what's going on i think most general populous people think that uh, experts are really getting the situation they understand what to do but it's not the case at all can that just seems like such a bad idea to me. I can't get over that. That like we were potentially unleashing something that we have no idea what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. But oh, yep. to be fair, right? Would Have you been viewed in amongst your colleagues? Like, are you kind of a, um, uh, I don't know what word to use. Not alarmist, but are are, are you the guy who worries more? Like, do most people in your position share your opinions? So it changed. Ten years ago, what I was doing was considered kind of crazy science fiction and very few people took seriously, especially in academia. Now we see thousands of top researchers all come and embrace this concern. We just had a letter signed by all the top labs and top scholars saying, yes, AI is an existential risk. So they, they accept what I'm saying. We're just 10 years behind. Do you think that people are starting to come around to it, or are we just embracing this? There is more understanding of it, for sure. There are still uh, people who disagree. They think there is absolutely nothing to worry about, or we can easily solve it. But uh, so far, they haven't produced any type of proof or even rigorous argumentation for why this product or service will be safe, no matter at what level of capability. What are you researching now? I'm looking at different limits of what can be done in this space in terms of understanding those systems, predicting their behaviors, communicating with them without ambiguity, monitoring next uh, training run, and so on. Couldn't we just... Oh, this is one of our listeners' submitted questions. Couldn't we just unplug it? That's the best question. I love it. We can also pour water on it. It completely solves the whole problem. No, uh, if a system is smarter than you, it will kind of anticipate you doing things like that and stop you from doing that. It's the how thing, right? From to the Think of like something like a computer virus. Sometimes people get those. Can you turn it off? Can you just, I don't like having computer viruses. Let me turn it off. How would that work? 
as, as someone who has had a computer virus on his computer. Like, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't do it. Right. And this is a dumb thing with no intelligence. This would be smarter than you. Um, okay. Feet to the fire. Ten years. Where are we? I'm not sure. Maybe some sort of virtual environment, but could be virtual heaven, could be virtual hell. If it was going to take over the world, like when do you think it would do it? Like, oh, we would be, we would hit the technology, we would hit the technology by this year, where I think that okay, maybe it could take over the world. So I, I suspect that the next version of this large model GPT five comes out, something will change. I don't know how soon that's going to be. They're claiming they're not training it right now. Probably takes about six months to train it. Probably takes about a year to test it. So most likely not in the next two years, but we don't know for sure. What does that mean, train it? Like, I don't understand what that means. So they take this uh, very large computer and tell it to go read everything it can on the internet, every book, every paper, every forum post. It reads everything and kind of tries to process that information. And that's how it gets smart. Oh, so it essentially, then it, and it's able to predict what we're doing based on all of those other models of no. I think we may have, t let me just want to touch on this again, but is that a difficult thing for AI to do? Like we've reached high end AI at that point, or is like, this is just the easy stuff for AI? Well, it's uh, kind of self-learning. It is capable of, uh, if I tell it, go read this book and come back and tell me about this book and let's have a discussion and let's write a short story inspired by this book. It can do those things. It can learn without me explicitly programming things in. That's pretty cool. What, like, okay, now I am kind of curious. Like, when you look at kind of into the weeds about this, what are you and your colleagues talking about in regards to it? So it's not obvious that everyone being killed is actually the worst scenario. It could get much worse. You can have, when we talk about malevolent actors, uh, suffering risks, torture, things like that. Is there any good news? Do you have any good news for me? <laughs> Um, I mean, right now, GPT-4 is only 20 bucks a month, so you can help them train the next generation with a payment. Great. So we can accelerate our doom to it. Um, that's where all the really all the questions that I had, man. It's interesting that normal people have a lot more common sense about those things. When I talk to average people, they immediately understand it. Just like you, they say, well, this is stupid. Why are we doing it? Then you talk to the brilliant experts. A lot of them don't have that same common sense. That's what the thing of, right, like how does that happen though? How does that happen that people like, the common people, so to speak, can immediately identify like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this, but then it just keeps going. Like what is, how does that happen? Well, we train scholars to think independently, to come up with contrarian solutions, so they do. And then there's some the money in it, right? But like, how do they ultimately make their money off of this? Well, it's very lucrative. I mean, every corporation wants to automate their call centers and make their video games more entertaining. I mean, if you can have this automated human-like intelligence for $20 a month, that's pretty good for your business. In the, in the things, though, that, ha that, that it has done, can people tell the difference? Uh, experts claim they can. Some studies show they can't. Uh, it's not obvious, depends on the domain. So in some domains, it's, uh, like humans are funny. We have stand-up comedians. There is no stand-up comedian, Chad GPT. It's not funny. So it's obvious that it's like horrible at telling jokes. In other domains like art, I'm not an expert in art. To me, it looks better than all the modern art I see in, but I'm not an expert. Can it be creative in the same way that we can be creative? I think it can. It's just people tend to discount how well it does, especially when they decide to compare it to the very best of humanity instead of average people. Yeah, I could see that, right? Like, okay, this isn't Shakespeare. Yeah, but it is Bill from accounting pretty well, right? 